Hey guys, I'm Adam from Top Dog, and we're doing another installment in our kind of DIY diabetic alert dog training. And these videos are really designed to be able to help not only our clients, but also anybody who's watching to be able to, to know a little bit better and understand a little bit better about what goes into training a diabetic alert dog and uh, to help you along with that process. Now, one of the most important keys to training a diabetic alert dog is having the odor that we use on hand so that we can train the dogs to alert to that odor. Now, what a diabetic alert dog does, just in a nutshell for those that are brand new, is they are smelling your blood sugar. Now, a common misbelief or misconception is that because they're smelling our blood sugar that we would have to train using blood samples or things like that in order to get the dog to alert to those blood glucose events that they need to alert to. And that's not actually the case. When a diabetic has, um, a low blood glucose event or a high blood glucose event, uh, the chemistry in the body actually affects other things, not just the blood. It affects their saliva, their breath, uh, it affects, well, for those of you that know a type 1 diabetic personally, it can make them, uh, it can affect their mind, they can start to slur their speech or, or make them extremely thirsty, things like that. And because it affects all those things, we're able to use saliva samples to train the dogs to alert to these blood glucose events that we want them to alert to. Now, at our facility, what we train for is the diabetic alert dog should alert to a blood glucose event uh, below 70 or above 300. So that's the samples that we're collecting for. And we need to collect lots and lots of those lows because it's harder for the dogs to detect those, so we spend more time training with those. So here's how you collect a sample so that it can be used in a training session. First of all, we use cotton dental rolls. They come in a pack like this. When they come out of the pack, they look like that. You've probably seen them when you get your wisdom teeth removed or something along those lines. Any kind of oral surgery or anything like that. Um, and we use these because they do a good job of kind of saturating or getting saturated without leaving a bunch of residue in your mouth. Some folks use cotton balls or cotton swabs or things like that. And the problem we have with that is that a lot of our clients just don't like it. It leaves a lot of little stringy, hairy, feely things in your mouth and, and nobody wants that. Um, so, step one of collecting a sample is takes place off camera. It, I already did it before I started. So, starting with clean hands. You need to clean your hands as best as possible. And that's really, really important. And we also prefer that you use unscented soap. Now, believe it or not, that's a little harder to find than it might sound like, and I actually have resorted to Amazon. Everything that I'm showing you, well, I guess everything, the unscented soap and these swabs, you can find in a link down below uh, through Amazon because I wanted to make it easier for you guys because I knew how hard it was to find some of those things, and now we've got Amazon, it makes it easier, but I still wanted to pinpoint you guys in the right direction. So first of all, I start with unscented hand soap, clean hands, and if you're not using unscented hand soap, at least rinse for a minute or two after you've washed your hands to try to get as much of that flowery or perfumey odor off of your hands because we're trying to train diabetic alert dogs, not these other flowery, uh, perfumey smell detection dogs. And if that's going on to the swab heavily, you're gonna find that the dog is gonna really pick up on that pretty easily. Dogs' noses are so amazing, and they pick up on the faintest odor, and so we need to try to keep this as clear of a picture as possible, which is why these steps are so important. So, step one, clean hands. Step two is to think back over the last 30 minutes. So, if you find yourself having a low blood glucose event, you check and you're below 70 and you think, I'm gonna collect some samples for my training, now you need to think back over the last 30 minutes. Have you eaten or drinking, eaten or drank anything that might affect the way that your mouth smells? So if you've eaten or drank in the last 30 minutes, you can't collect a sample at that time. And that includes gum. So water is okay. Uh, sodas, things like that though, are gonna go ahead and eliminate that. So if you've drank water in the last 30 minutes, that's gonna be fine. But any food or anything like that that you've consumed in the last 30 minutes, we're not gonna wanna use that sample because again, the odor's just gonna be too strong. It's gonna override the odor that we're trying to pinpoint for the dog. So, I haven't ate or drank for 30 minutes, I haven't been chewing gum, I'm good to go. So that's when I take my sample, pick it up, I'm gonna put it in, put it in my cheek, and I'm gonna put one on each side. 
I've got a pretty big mouth so I can do that. Not everybody can. Now the important part is that I wait long enough for that sample to get good and saturated. Now once I've placed it in my mouth, I don't touch it again. I'm going to spit it directly in the bag. So for those of you that are really squeamish, you might want to look away. I don't know if that's going to gross anybody out. But I wait until it's very saturated. Now, for those of you that when you're having a low blood glucose event, have a hard time generating saliva, you're going to have to leave it in there a little longer, maybe swish it around a little bit because it needs to be very saturated. Once it's very saturated, about 30 seconds or so, it's going to go into the bag. Again, I don't touch it once it's gone into my mouth because whatever odor is on my hands, we're trying to have the most powerful odor on there being that odor that we're trying to help the dog pinpoint. So, once it's come out of my mouth, no more touching it. I'm not going to touch it. I'm going to spit it directly into the bag. Okay? Now, you can do that as many times as possible. Again, most folks are only able to get about five or six swabs per low blood glucose event because they're just not generating a lot of saliva. So do it as many times as possible um, so that way you can stockpile a little bit. In the initial training phase, we're using three to four of these a day, and so we need to get a whole bunch of these stockpiled for our training. All right, we've got a couple in there. Um, now, an important part about our storage. We always use freezer bags. Sorry about that little glitch there. I didn't realize that the camera had actually shut off, so I'm having to come back in and re-record the end of the video and splice them together now. So. The part where it cut out, I was just talking about the importance of using freezer bags. And that's really important because you don't want to put all this work into collecting this sample and doing it just right, not getting it contaminated and all that, only to have a free, only to put it in the freezer and it to get freezer burned and be unusable. So once you put it in the bag, squeeze all the air out of it, roll it up tight to get all that air out. And then what you're going to do, and this part's very important, is you're going to come back and you're going to label it. Now the most important part of your label is going to be the date. I'm going to tell you why here in just a second, but you're going to start with your date. Next, you're going to move to what level your blood glucose was at. And so we're going to pretend right now that I was at 65. Finally, you're going to put your last name. This is of course for our clients that are dropping them off here at the facility. Uh, those of you at home won't have to do this. So when you're all done, it should look something like that with the date, your blood glucose level, and your last name on there. <clears throat> Again, remember you can put five or six samples in a bag. That's not a big deal at all. You got that all labeled properly. You're going to roll it up and you're going to double bag it. One freezer bag is not enough. <clears throat> Excuse me. So one freezer bag is not enough. We're going to double bag it. Again, it's worth the extra few cents to uh, use high quality freezer bags and a double bag just because you're putting all this work into it, no use in doing it if it's going to end up being useless. We've got a double bag and then usually as an extra precaution I like to go ahead and put it in some kind of Tupperware or a mason jar with a lid, something along those lines. Once you've done that, you're good to go, you're all done. So a couple of quick reminders. Um, Wash your hands, unscented soap. Check the link down below for that unscented soap uh, on Amazon that we use. Then you're gonna come in, sit down. You're gonna go ahead and pop those samples, uh, those swabs into your mouth or dental rolls, whatever you wanna call them. From there, you're gonna make sure that you don't touch. You spit directly into the bag. Seal that bag up, get all the air out as much as possible. Date it. So then put that inside of another freezer bag and then those can go inside of a Tupperware, a mason jar, something like that in your freezer. Now, the reason why I said the date was so important earlier is because these samples are good for about six months if they sit um, unbothered in the freezer. So if you're getting them out, using them frequently, try to get them back in there as quickly as possible. Don't let them thaw, refreeze, thaw, refreeze, all that stuff seems to really mess them up. So, they're good for six months as long as they're not getting messed with too much in the freezer. You know, you pull yours out to use for training and you leave the rest in there, you do it quickly, then you should be good to go. Sorry, again, we had another glitch. So, once we've got the samples out, then they're good for about three days of use. 
Now what I mean by that is when we're doing like some of the mid phases of training where we're using scent tins and things like that, those samples are going to be good as long as we use them, they don't get anything on them, they stay in their little scent tins, we put them back in a Ziploc and they go in the fridge when we're, we're not using them. They can't stay out for 72 hours straight. If they're in and out of the fridge throughout the day, they're going to be okay. But uh, in the initial phases of training, like the puppy stuff that you see us do, the scent imprinting, all that stuff, those samples are pretty much one-time use because they're getting food particles on them and all kinds of other stuff. So they're pretty much one-time use and then we throw them away. That's why we go through, through so many in the early stages. So again, make sure you're following these protocols so that way you're giving your dog as clear of a picture as possible. That's really, really important. If you've got all kinds of other residue and stuff on your hands while you're doing this, you're gonna end up with a dog that alerts to ham sandwiches or whatever you just ate, as opposed to a dog that's always pinpointing that exact odor that they're supposed to. Thanks so much for watching. Uh, if you have any questions, just give me a call, email me. Again, read the description down below for a few more instructions and also the links to be able to buy the stuff if you need to. Um, thanks again, and we'll talk to you later.